Good evening and welcome to the July 15th Wednesday night Bible class of the Boone Church of Christ. Tonight we're going to talk about the importance of seeking God in our lives. I believe that you and I were created to seek God. Now I know that not all people believe this. But I firmly believe that the Bible teaches that we were created with a desire to seek Him. God created us and He placed this desire for Him within our hearts. He did this so that we would desire to seek Him. Listen to Acts chapter 17 verses 24 through 27. This is Paul in Athens and it's from his sermon on Mars Hill. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands now why would God do this with his creation listen to what Paul says next God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. God also placed within us a longing for eternity, a desire for an eternal, eternal relationship with him. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. You know that craving that people have, that, that question that people ask uh, you know, during their lifetime? Why am I here? What, what is this all about? Is this all there is to this life? Why do people always ask that question? Because we're all the same in one respect. Solomon says that God has placed this concept of eternity in the human heart. That's so that we would seek answers to those questions. And in seeking answers to those questions, it would direct us to God. There's also this moral compass we have. For example, when it comes to knowing God's will, there are many things that we do have to be taught that are wrong. But there are certain things that deep down we just know are wrong. We know it's wrong to take someone's life. We know that child abuse is wrong. We know it's wrong to steal something from someone. We don't have to be taught those things. We know as soon as we do them, before we do them, after we do them. We just know they're wrong. That's because God has placed this moral compass within us. Here is the truth. God created us with a desire for Him, and He's looking for those people who are seeking Him. Listen to Psalm 14 and verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. What a beautiful picture. The Creator looking down on His creation, looking at each human life on earth. He's wanting to see if anyone is truly wise. Who are those who are truly wise? They are those who are seeking Him. So are we seeking God in our lives? You know, there's something about that desire that we need to know. We can suppress that desire. We can suppress that truth that's inside of us, that there is something more to this life. We can take that, that question that we have and that, that void that we feel that, that there's got to be something more. And we can suppress that truth by just anchoring so tightly into this physical creation and just living all for the here and for the now. God wants us to live for something else, and he's placed that truth within us, that desire within us for him, so that it would take us on a search, on a journey to find him. And if we truly want to seek God, there is this place that we get to. There's this question that we have to ask and that we have to answer. The question is, how should we go about 
seeking God. Learning the answer to this question is crucial, and God tells us the answer to this question in his word. Though there are many aspects to consider in a question like this, there is a passage in Isaiah chapter 55 that reveals much about how we should seek God. So we're going to take a look at the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 55. And one of the things that we're going to see right away in the first five verses is that we should seek God with desire and understanding. Isaiah 55 verses 1 through 5. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the peoples? I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know, and peoples will come to you, running to obey, because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. God says that we should seek him with our heart. God, through Isaiah, begins this thought, with the phrase, is anyone thirsty? This speaks to our desire. You know, maybe this goes without saying, but having the desire to seek God is really something that we do have to remember. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Do you hear the promise that God gives there? We will find him. We, we will seek him and if we seek him, we will find him when? when we seek him with all of our heart, when we truly desire to find him. Listen to Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. You know, when we look at this story uh, in, in, in Matthew chapter 16, this account of Jesus talking to his disciples, and we ask the question, what does Jesus say is crucial? What, what, what do we need to do to follow him? We often say, uh, as the NIV, it's a more familiar passage, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Those are the three things we've got to do. We've got to deny our self-will. We've got to take up our cross and, and represent Jesus, and we've got to follow him. But do you know there is another uh, requirement that's in there that precedes these three? It is, if any of you wants to be my follower. See, we have to really want to follow Jesus. If we don't want to follow him, if we don't have that desire, we're not going to take up our cross. You know, we're not going to deny ourselves. We're not going to follow him in places he wants to lead us. We've got to want it. God has made a gracious offer to us, and we have to decide if it's something we want. Again, Isaiah wrote, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? What's he talking about? Is he talking about physical food? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, God says, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. No, God isn't talking about physical food. God is talking about that craving that we have within us, the desire that he placed within us to seek him and to follow him. He's talking about spiritual food. And if we really want to satisfy that desire, we have to satisfy it with the one who created us, the one who gave us that desire, because he is the one that satisfies that desire. If we don't really want God, we won't pursue him. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and verse 6 said this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We've got to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. It has to be a dominant desire in our life. Our desire is seen in our thirst for God in our lives, but having that desire leads us to an, to an important truth. 
Because God not only tells us that we should seek him with our heart, we also have to seek him with our mind. Come to me, he says, with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. After God's gracious offer of life, he tells us that he alone can show us to f- how to find that life. So the first step, as we read, uh, to seeking God is desire. And the second step to seeking God speaks to our understanding. We acknowledge that God has not just a plan, but he has the plan, the only plan. So we listen to him through his word so we can understand that plan. We listen to him as he explains to us how we accept his gracious offer of life. See, God hasn't left it up to us to decide the path we take to enter into a relationship with him. He has revealed that truth. He has revealed that path through his word. It is then our decision whether or not we submit to his instructions. Now let's go to verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 5. And here we're going to see that we need to seek God with a sense of urgency. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. God's given us an opportunity. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. And it's an opportunity for this lifetime. Listen to James chapter 4 verse 14. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. You see James there writing about the brevity of life? Your life is here for a little while, and then it's gone. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, At just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. This is the simple truth of God's invitation. Present availability doesn't guarantee future availability. We have to seek God with a sense of urgency today. We have to seek God now. Isaiah also points out that we should seek God with action. Our last verse, verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 55, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. Do you see all of the action phrases that are there in verse 7? Those who are wicked, what do they need to do? They need to change their ways. They need to change their thoughts. And they need to repent and turn to God. Seeking God is not passive. Seeking God is active. Seeking God is more than just wanting to seek him. But we do have to have the desire for him with all of our hearts. Seeking God is more than just understanding how to draw near to him but we do have to understand how. Seeking God is more than realizing the need to do so with a sense of urgency. Because see, we can feel urgency and then just not do anything. Seeking God means that we have to follow through, really follow through. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways that I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. This is a classic if-then proposition that God makes. If, if his people do certain things, then something will happen. If they humble themselves, if they pray to him, if they seek him, and if they repent, then God will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will provide spiritual healing for them. Do you see overall here what Isaiah is writing about seeking God? We begin with the desire, the desire that God placed within us. And we act on that desire and we seek God and we seek to understand his will for our lives. And 
as we begin to understand his will for our lives, we'll, we'll, we'll recognize the sense of urgency associated uh, with obedience to him, and we'll take that action. We will be obedient to him. So are you actively seeking God in your lives? Can you see it happening in your own life? Are you seeking him morally? Is your choice to seek God morally reflected in the decisions that you make each day? Do your moral choices lead you towards becoming the person that God wants you to be? Are you seeking to put God first in your relationships? Are you seeking the right people in your life? Let me explain what I mean by this. I'm not talking about social or class distinctions, and I'm certainly not talking about shutting out those who need your physical help or spiritual help. I'm talking about having an awareness, an awareness that the people you associate with will have an influence on you. And that influence will be primarily either spiritually healthy or spiritually destructive. Seeking God and putting him first in our lives will have direct uh, impact uh, on, our, on our, our relationships. It will have a spiritually healthy bearing on our relationships when we do put him first and seek him first in our lives. Are you seeking God right now? I realize that not all of us are being affected by this virus in the same way. For some, life has slowed down, but some are as busy or busier than they ever were before. But there is one thing that I think most of us are experiencing in a very similar way, and that's the consistent flow of information about the virus and its impact on our physical and sometimes our emotional health. While so many people are talking about that, I want to urge you to give careful consideration to your spiritual health. This is an opportunity to spend time in God's Word. It's an opportunity to do some spiritual self-assessment. It's a time to reassess our spiritual commitments. And now is the time to renew our commitment to seeking God and putting Him first in our lives. It's a time to recommit to the importance of assembling together as a spiritual family as soon as we're able to do so. And it's a time to draw near to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It's really clear. God created us to seek Him, and He is the only one that can fill that void in our lives. So often people will try and fill that void God placed void in their lives with the wrong things. People will try and fill that emptiness with possessions, or the pursuit of possessions, or status, or power, or a whole host of other things that I'm sure you can probably think of that are not spiritually healthy. It won't work. As much as people may try and make this world their home, it just won't work. And it won't work because that void can only be filled by God. That's the way he made us. That's why we don't come to God on our terms. He's told us how to seek him and how to find him. And he's continually looking down on his creation to see if any are wise, to see if any are seeking him. So let's commit to seeking God right now.